um, Tom from Kex is going to talk to us about 10 years teaching graduate students online. Some hard lessons. So the, the title alone suggests we may get some, get some interesting reflection from Tom here. Okay, and um, the notes and links and everything are online, so if you just search on the title of the presentation, you should find it. I thought I'd go old school, so I actually did PowerPoint, which caused me some struggles because I don't know how to use this version of PowerPoint. Which button do I push for the slideshow? Oh, here we go, from the beginning. There we go. Okay, so I'm an honorary lecturer in uh, computer science at ANU. I've actually been a tutor in some of the um, things that Chris has run. Uh, I feel like I should just be able to just get up here and say what all those other people just said because I guess I'm not saying anything terribly different to the previous presenters except I've been doing things within a traditional semester long course format and professional requirements and assessment and all of that and been trying to work around the system rather than trying to change it. So in 2008, I was commissioned to design a course in what was then called Green Computing, and it was the Australian Computer Society which commissioned the course, um, a professional body similar to the Institution of Engineers, and they were running um, online postgraduate semester-long distance education courses. So they asked me to write one in green computing, environmental computing things. Um, I designed it for them. We then had this ridiculous discussion where I said, uh, we could run this at the ANU, is that okay? And they said, well, whatever. And I kept having an argument with them. It turned out they'd given me the intellectual property rights to the material, so they couldn't understand why I was asking them. So I made it Creative Commons license, and it's been running at the ANU since 2009. Uh, it's currently running, offered by ANU every second year, and Athabasca University in Canada every now and then. So um, in terms of some of the things you do with courses, addressing the industry um, accreditation requirements, so the Australian Computer Society uses a UK-based skills definition set called the Skills Framework for the Information Age, SOFIA for short. And the idea is this is a table which is seven levels across and 40-something rows long, and you should be able to identify every skill a computer professional in the world needs somewhere in this table. And essentially what I did is take one of the requirements and align to that. And that's the definition. That is Sophia version 7, level 5, uh, with that. So the idea was to meet those requirements. <coughs> Some of the things I learned along the way, um, what I inherited from the ACS was a format that had lots of individual PDF files you give the student a PDF file every week for everything they needed to do, or one for the course notes, one for the assessment, whatever. Um, there were discussion forums in Moodle. Uh, every week this, you would give them a mark. I found this all very confusing, so over the time I evolved to just have a Moodle ebook with all the course notes in it and structured the weekly assessment more carefully. Um, I gave a copy of this course to Athabasca University. They produced a uh, MOOC-like version of it, which included uh, automated quizzes, and I'd never thought to use these. So I just took their automated quizzes, added some more, changed them a bit, and inserted them into my course as part of the assessment. The latest version of the course, 12-week uh, standard university course run in a semester, 20% of the assessment next time will be for discussion in the forums, 10% for the automated quiz questions, 70% for traditional written assignments, but with 10% for planning and 60% for doing. 
I have that classic thing where a student will wait until the week of the assignment to start work. So a few years ago I introduced the thing where you say to them, OK, for a small amount of the assessment you have to submit a outline of what you're going to do in a plan. Um, I keep changing the amount of assessment required and maybe we'll try a peer thing with that. Um, nothing terribly radical there. Some of the things I learned along the way. Um, mine was the only one of these courses from the ACS which had no videos and the course still has no videos except for one at the beginning and introducing me to the students. So if somebody will pay me the time to sit down and prepare videos, I'll do it. But so, but in, so far nobody has and the research literature shows that while students like looking at videos, it does not add to their learning. Students without videos learn just as well as students with videos. What I do do is if I find a video happens to exist, I will include it like a reading, but I'm not sitting down doing the equivalent of recorded lectures. Um, some students sort of hanker after a bit of that, so maybe I'll relent and add a few minutes per week later on, but so far I haven't. Um, the first one of those that I forgot, it's a skill to learn. So when I started doing this, I knew nothing about um, online education and not much about education in general and had to learn the hard way. Subsequently, I've been formally educated in education by the ANU and other institutions and it just makes it so much easier. I was a little annoyed by a comment in the, one of the presentations this morning about have you learnt from student feedback in a course? I did not put up my hand because I didn't have to learn from student feedback. I've been trained and qualified and, in, and am competent in teaching, so I don't have to learn by trial and error. I have learnt the research and what, learns, what has worked for people in the past. Third one, peer assessment works. I knew that, but but at a gut level, I never really believed it until I was a student in an online course where I was forced to do peer assessment. And then I saw the value of it in terms of what I learned and how effective it was. After that, I gave it a go and I found that my assessment was, I would mark 10% harder than the students would peer assess. So. I've now included that in the green course and it's relatively un uncontroversial. You need marks to keep students working online. So particularly if you don't see the students, it's very hard to get them to do things, especially if they're distance students, which some of mine are, because they have families and jobs and dogs and garbage to take out. And I see... Um, assessment as a way to give them power that when somebody says, well, can you go and do that? And they say, no, I've got to do this. I have to do it because there are marks. So I, I see it as not, not so much forcing the students to do some work, uh, but empowering them to do it and saying, this is an important part of what you're doing because uh, there are marks. It doesn't take many. A few percent per week will do. Um, just the, uh, the second last one there, a little feedback. Um, I did a whole course in uh, assessment and feedback, and in that it was stated that the research shows that students do not read the feedback on assignments. And I thought that was rubbish, of course they do. Up until the time I got back my assignment on feedback, I looked at the mark and I just flicked it aside without reading the feedback. So what I do now is I give the student a weekly mark and next to it I put the feedback. So they're physically right next to each other, a line or two of feedback, and I think that makes it more effective, not pages of stuff. They, there are still pages of stuff in long assignments, but you put the feedback right at the thing. So let me show you some of the ways to do these things. Um, this is the computer literalist version of how to align 
um, external still requirements to outcomes and assessment. There is the international skills requirement from SEVEA. Evaluate, identify, blah, blah, blah. Here's the learning outcome. Evaluate, identify, same wording. Here is an assignment requirement. Evaluate and identify. I simply literally took the what it said in the international skills requirement for the profession, put it in the learning outcomes, put in the assessment items. So it's very easy to show for a accreditation reason. It wasn't really like that. I wrote the course first and then sent a copy to the UK, to the people who write the international skills. And they happened to spontaneously define a skill which very much matched the course that I'd written. They reverse engineered it in effect. Um, they keep changing the skill definition every few years. I have to keep changing my definitions and assessments. Um, there was already mention of this. That's the e-book I give the students inside the course. This is the published external version of the same thing. They're essentially identical. Um, that goes then to Athabasca and they might make some slight changes in the assessment. <coughs> but essentially it's pre-published in advance. Um, a little technical thing, students use mobile devices. You no longer have to write your course materials specifically to suit a mobile device. This is the desktop Moodle. This is what it looks like on a mobile device. That's called responsive web design. It's built in. But you have to in make sure your content will reflow and of obviously chop it up into small bits. So I have small things for people that can read on a bus, small quizzes they can do, that sort of thing. And there's an automated quiz. All the, the, the automated uh, system inserts different numbers, so each student gets a different question, so they can't cheat by taking the answers from each other. And the peer assess forums is simply each student marks, gives each posting a mark out of two, the system adds up the average. I check it each week. Mostly I just let them through. Sometimes I adjust them. Um, there are references formally in the material and there's several papers I've published, uh, one with one of my students, um, on how to do all this. Um, we have time for questions? Absolutely. Yep. Okay. Thank you, Tom. Have you had to use it? Very uh, hard. <laughs> um, okay, thank you very much, Tom. Um, I'll open it to the floor if anybody has some thoughts, questions, comments. Okay. Um, I'm intrigued because obviously I haven't had as many well, I can do a peer assessment, but in an undergraduate course, my colleague over here, we do peer assessment. And it, didn't work. So I'd be interested to know what elements ensured that your peer assessment worked. Okay, first of all, these are postgraduate students. Yes. So, yeah, postgrads are a bit better at it. A bit better at it. One thing was keep the marking system simple. So it's either zero, no good, one, okay, two, good. It's a very small scale. Um, it's on specific questions and so each week of the course is on a topic and it's framed around that so it's fairly clear what it's about. Um, they know that I'm checking it um, and the other part is I fudge the assessment scheme. So the, the, quiz, the quizzes and the discussion forum assessment are only used effectively for competency based assessment. So based on that, the most they can get is a credit. So I have said that an ANU credit is equivalent to competent. They can't get a distinction or a high distinction based on peer assessment. And that m removes a lot of the incentive for them to fudge the system or be nasty to one another. Of course, it's, it's only going to help them pass. It's not going to help them excel. 
So I think, I think that makes it a lot easier. The other thing is I've done a whole one semester unit of training in how to do this sort of assessment. So I'm confident in what to do. Before jumping to Bib's question, I just follow up and ask um, with, the, with a simple scale like one, two, sorry, zero, one, two, no good, okay, good. How do the students come to know what good means and look like? How do they identify that this is good? Um, they are given, um, there, there's a, a sort of a practice exercise mm -hmm. beforehand, um, and they are given weekly feedback on their own work. One thing I haven't done is exposed, the students can't see what the assessment for each other is because I was worried about stress and embarrassment for students. So the main thing is the practice exercise to start with. Um, there are formal rubric type scales to indicate the sort of thing to do. My question was actually, was about the same thing as I and I had put this together. But it sort of does lead me on to a question about um, perhaps being a bit provocative and maybe some of the other ed designers in the room will have comments on this. When you say you were all about how to, you know, how students learn and how to teach all well, my question is about cultures as students and whether, you know, your law student culture is actually different from your ex student. And so whether actually the same things don't necessarily work. That's possible, although the main thing I, one great lesson I learned when I became a postgraduate education student is as soon as I enrolled as a student, I started behaving like a student. Oh, do I have to do that? You know, can I warm marks? That sort of thing. Um, computer science students are typically nerdy type people. I think the discipline persona outweighs cultural aspects largely. So engineering computer science students are a typical breed in a way, I think maybe art but, students. But so that's my point. So then law students are arguably a typical breed. So do different things work in different places or do the same hmm. work? I think that... Yeah, I, if, if the educational research is all saying this will work, hmm. does that have to be tempered by the discipline? Yes, yes, it has to be tempted by the discipline. I think the, the bigger issue has been the literacy, where you have a mix of um, English as a second language student in with the other students, and are you unfairly favouring the ones where they're more comfortable writing in English, um, I think is the issue. We used to have a problem with students who didn't know how to reference things. So in the first few weeks I would check, have they copied this from the Wikipedia entry, um, for example, and I'd set a trap there because I wrote the Wikipedia entry on the topic. So I could easily <laughs> see, you know, if they scrolled down they saw my name at the bottom, but most of them didn't, they just copied bits. So I think that was more of an issue than a particular discipline background or, we, or even cultural background. I think the language issue. Any other? I'm just curious about um, what format and process you use to provide accessible notes to their phones. Okay, um, what I simply do is I use um, a basic form of HTML. So I will laboriously use the um, editor in Moodle for their form of ebook. Um, and I will avoid using any more than the basic italics, bold, standard headings, um, so that there isn't anything where I've used a particular font or colour or anything. Um, I then use that to export it to the other versions of the document. So basically I, do, I just avoid anything too complicated. and. Um, this is a text-heavy subject, so there are no videos, there are very few images. Um, so it's just um, mostly plain text, which just gets reformatted. So it's not about sort of implementing or adding something, it's just avoiding putting anything in that would so mess up the formatting. Mobile, mobile 
Uh, no, these are just web pages. Yeah, that's what I'm wondering. Yeah. So, so you create a page in Moodle. Yeah. But you export it? Well, the students get the ebook format. When I first did this, I got went mad. I produced an ebook, I produced a PDF version, a EPUB electronic book version, uh, a paperback, a hardback, <laughs> and a um, large print hardback for people with low vision. And I found the students just use the ebook. PDF, and if they want a PDF, they just generated the PDF or so printed it. Just pages, it's just pages. HTML pages, um, and the system just automatically reformats it to fit on the phone. Um, if they're using the uh, the Moodle app, just the same way, and if it gets exported to a different university, all of the colour schemes and fonts and everything automatically change to suit the institution. I don't. Sorry. I have a quick observation. Just, and I'm sorry to um, do this. I just occurred to me that when I did my presentation on that course, I didn't mention that the entire course is online. Um, and I do that deliberately. Um, I do that whenever I present at legal things. I apologise to jump on the end of yours, but I was watching yours and looking at online things and thought nobody would realise that I was talking about an entirely online course, probably, um, unless you knew me like my colleagues do. But um, so um, just to say that that format that we use worked online. Um, and I didn't really master that. In well, it, it, <laughs> it eventually dawned on me that it, it's, not, it's not a big thing and that education's education. Mm -hmm. And the, the approach I'd adopt designing a new course now would be to design it online and then add any bits that, that suited face-to-face -face environment and someone was willing to pay the resources for. Um, rather than the approach of saying we've got a face-to-face -face course, let's make it online. Um, so you guess in, in closing, a comment I was going to make, jumping back to the Vibs point in the discussion there, which I can link to my aunt to say here, um, I was reminded of Garrison and Anderson's community of required more, which they originally talked about to describe online, but I actually think it can equally apply in other situations. A key point here is that they talk about three presences in their language, so a cognitive presence, a teaching presence, and a social presence. And, and they would argue that you need all three of those to come together to provide a useful and effective and enjoyable learning environment, teaching and learning experience. And so I think that social presence part of it, as they argue, can link to that question of culture, which um, can be put on the table, and how that question of culture can play out in terms of where students have come from what kind of discipline cultures or professional cultures there might be and what their experience in their learning. So I would, I would think that they might argue that that question of culture actually is quite important in that social presence um, component of their role, I guess. And I, I, yeah, and I've suffered this myself being a Canadian postgraduate student and, and being the only Australian in the class and they would use Canadian slang terms and things and I'd have no idea what they were talking about. Uh, but, even, but even more so, most of, because of his education, there were like two males in the class and 40 females. And for me, that was more of the cultural issue. I was the minority um, and, and had trouble interacting with the rest of the class as a result. And was in a sort of small male ghetto. <laughs> as we... Thanks, Tom. Yep.